Okay, I think I'm getting the green light to go ahead here. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar, Mitigating COVID-19 and Preserving Angola's Momentum for 2021. Um, my name is Grace Goodrich. I'm a uh, field editor with Africa Oil and Power, and I will be one of your co-moderators today, along with Mr. Werner Ayuk Egba from the African Energy Chamber. How are you doing, Werner? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Grace. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Um, well, it's my pleasure to introduce this webinar brought to you by the African Energy Chamber and Africa Oil and Power. Um, we have a very strong lineup of speakers for you today uh, who know this industry inside and out. Um, but before we introduce our panelists, I'm just going to go over a few rules for you all, uh, for our audience, on how to engage with this panel. So first off, uh, if you take a look at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a few buttons. Uh, the first one is the chat box. So that button is there for all of you to chat amongst yourselves. So uh, the latest number we've received is close to 500 viewers who are registered and will be tuning in from all around the world uh, to this webinar. So please do feel free to share uh, where you're tuning in from, as well as your thoughts on today's conversation as it progresses. Um, it's very important for me to note, uh, please do not any, uh, ask any questions to the panel in this box as it will not be monitored uh, for this. To ask questions to our panelists, uh, you will also see a dedicated Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, please do submit your questions here as Werner and I will be monitoring it um, and trying to get in as many of your questions as possible throughout the panel. Um, additionally, to make this session interactive, we'll also be fielding a few polls throughout the session. So if a box comes up on your monitor, uh, please do weigh in and we'll be sharing the results of those polls throughout the session. And then the final and third button uh, I'd like to draw your attention to is the hand icon. So this is for members of the media. Um, if you are a participant of the media, please click that button and virtually raise your hand. And someone from the AOP team will accommodate you to be able to ask your questions to our panelists live at the end of the session. Uh, the final note is that the session is currently being recorded uh, and the recording will be made available at the end of the webinar on AOP's YouTube channel. Okay, so now on to our panelists, who it's my pleasure to introduce to you. Um, our first panelist is Mr. Federico Correa, oil and gas partner with Deloitte Angola. Uh, Mr. Correa brings 15 years of industry and supply chain experience to today's conversation, 12 of which have been spent working exclusively with energy, resource, and industrial clients across Europe, the US, and Africa. Uh, Mr. Correa advises clients on operations and logistics improvements, as well as asset management projects. In Angola, these clients have been the Ministry of Energy and Water, Sanangul Group, Exxon, BP, Sad Oil, Total, and more. Welcome, Mr. Correa. Where are you joining us from today? Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm joining from uh, Portugal. Uh, my, my wife is nurse, so I was in Angola when we started the lockdown in Portugal, and she has been escalated to support uh, the, the public in the uh, in the public hospital of Braga, and so I'm um, I'm working in remote work in from home, and uh, doing uh, the internal stuff with kids. But uh, I expect that uh, everyone is safe. And uh, thank you, and very welcome to 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 this webinar. I expect that you will like it. Yes, thank you for joining us, and thank you to your to your wife for her service. Um, next, we are joined by Mr. Adelson Paolo, Country General Manager at DOF Subsea, where Mr. Paolo oversees sales, operations, HSE, business development, uh, the list goes on. Um, Mr. Paolo has over 14 years of experience working in the Angolan energy sector, uh, working with Total, BP, and GE prior to his role at DOF Subsea. Welcome, Mr. Paolo. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you very much, and uh, welcome everybody to the webinar. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, this will be a more uh, an interactive, I'd say, discussion. We are here also to learn from you, and we hope we can contribute with our ideas to make the oil and gas and economy in Angola better for 2021 and onwards. Uh, keep say, Stay safe, stay home, and uh, let's enjoy this webinar. Thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Mr. Sergio Pugliesi, Executive President of the Angolan Chapter of the African Energy Chamber, where he oversees the implementation of the Chamber's strategy in Angola while managing its investment promotion platform to attract quality investment going into the country. 
having began his career at Stuart Petroleum in Australia and then moving to BP and Statoil in Angola prior to his work with the Chamber. Sergio is a seasoned entrepreneur and Angolan oil executive, and he's also the managing director of Angola services provider Amipa, as well as executive chairman for AIDA Corporation. Thank you for joining us, Sergio. Where, where are you located at the moment? Good afternoon. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm currently in Lisbon. I got caught in Lisbon for this one, so I had to stay here. And um, uh, yeah, I'm looking very much forward to this discussion. Um, you know, we at the Chamber are always advocating for investment attraction, looking uh, at the positive outlook for things. And uh, we, are, we are looking forward to give our contribution and, and, uh, and talk about what, uh, what, what good things we can bring to this. So, and, and to Angola and attract investment, uh, make a, 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 a promote a, a narrative for a good climate for everybody. So yeah, looking forward to the discussion, everybody's uh, questions and inputs and, uh, and uh, all the panelists also, uh, let's enjoy this, yeah. Thank you. Um, and our final panel, fa final panelist today is Mr. Federico Costa, CFO at Technip FMC. Um, after working for 10 years in Portugal in accounting and tax consulting, Mr. Costa came to Angola in 2012 to major multinational consulting firm PKF, and for the past six years has been in the oil and gas sector, uh, first starting at Angola LNG and then moving to French services provider Preciosa Linjevig as CFO, and currently since 2019 as CFO for French American services provider Technip FMC. Welcome, Mr. Costa. How are you doing? Hi, hi, Chris. How are you doing? Very well, well, thank. You. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, for all the attendees, let's hope that today we can share a lot of our experiences and uh, be a, a very learning step stone to 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 next steps going forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Werner. Uh, Werner is Senior Vice President with the African Energy Chamber, where he leads the organization's international outreach and public policy initiatives, working with governments and various uh, stakeholders to create policies that ease investment into Africa's energy sector. He is also the director at Joburg-based DMWA Resources, where he heads the firm's energy and financial services consulting practice. So Werner, I'm gonna pass it over to you uh, to give us some context for this conversation and, and to get it started. Uh, thank you very much, Grace, and welcome to everybody on the panel and uh, welcome to everybody who's dialed in. Uh, it's pretty simple. I, I guess the context here is uh, pretty much where the industry finds itself at the moment. Uh, Angola is uh, second largest producer uh, in Africa. Uh, Pre-COVID, I think uh, somewhere about 1.4 million barrels a day. Um, and so just from that perspective, uh, Angola is extremely important with respect to uh, the industry in Africa, but also because it's uh, an important member of OPEC. And so a lot of people across the continent look to Angola with respect to direction as to what is going to happen. Uh, also, particularly because we have all the major players uh, currently very active in Angola. So it's always uh, some kind of a laboratory to be able to understand globally what is likely to happen within the industry. And so for us, it was very important to be able to speak to market participants, but also to be able to exchange, uh, you know, with, with the likes, uh, you know, Federico Correa or Federico Costa, or also uh, with Aldi San Paolo, to be able to get an understanding of the challenges which companies are facing on the ground. And so what we're gonna try and do today is pretty much to tease that. And if at all, we're gonna leave with two things today is to pretty much say, you know, how do companies uh, actually mitigate the effects of COVID nowadays uh, in Angola, number one, in the oil and gas sector, and secondly, despite COVID, uh, where are the opportunities? Uh, whenever there are crises like these ones, uh, what happens is that, uh, you know, opportunities is also open for the brave and for people who can spot opportunities. And so the question here is, where are the opportunities in that sense uh, among this, uh, in this particular environment? And uh, how can we share some of those ideas? So my first question would be to uh, Federico Martins, 
uh, what have you seen uh, in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on levels of, uh, I would say, activity? You know, and how are some of your clients coping with the difficulties that have come, you know, from, first of all, from a cost perspective, I imagine there's a high pressure on the number of companies to deal with cost, given the low price of oil, uh, but also HSC challenges around uh, how companies are dealing with COVID-19 at the moment. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, when we look to the, the industry itself, and starting from uh, upstream, um, Angola is not uh, facing a different challenge that uh, all the global industry is facing. Uh, all the operators are challenging to reduce uh, OPEX, and all the major oil and gas companies, uh, common known as IOCs, have uh, stopped or reanalyzed all the capex uh, investments uh, around the world. So based on that, uh, what is happening with the, with the industry in Angola is fully aligned with what we are seeing in the rest of the world. Uh, when we look to, to Angola itself, uh, and we look to, to upstream, um, I would say that uh, in, in the last uh, four to five years, Angola was doing already um, a great a great progress around the local content so i would say that if we look to to this point it's uh, for example uh, covid probably is a enabler to to fast track the the, the local content because uh, um, the the problem of covid is that uh, we we avoid the the the, the access of people so I would say that also in personnel on board around the platforms, we the companies are trying to reduce the level of people that are on board. So I would and the, we and we have uh, restrictions uh, to 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 fly. Uh, so at the at the moment, the industry I itself is doing the their normal routines and the the, the level of protection uh, in Angola has not uh, decreased based on the COVID itself. So I would say that for local context pers perspective, for example, it's, a, it's an opportunity to, 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 to continue to, to, to invest and to have more national people engaged and doing the, 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 the key tasks uh, in terms of operation maintenance uh, around the upstream stuff. Um, of course, that the, the, the sentiment uh, caused by COVID and in parallel with, uh, with uh, this new crude uh, oil downturn price, of course, that this impacts uh, the industry itself. It, it impacts not only in Angola, it is, is an impact that we are facing globally. Um, and uh, what is the challenge now for any country that are uh, in the top 20 as uh, oil producers like Angola it is now, uh, is to try to put uh, their self uh, in a good shape um, around uh, the regulation and the tax uh, royalties uh, to enable that for next license bids or to push the actual companies um, moreover the international companies that are playing uh, in the in the country to keep their uh, operations going on and probably to extend to their concessions for uh, uh, longer periods um, in terms of uh, new fields, of course, that uh, any bid now it will be it will suffer uh, a bit because uh, the all worldwide the companies are pushing back their capex. But I would say that in terms of production uh, and considering the latest cuts done by OPEC in terms of um, uh, conjunction production in uh, OPEC uh, um, group, uh, Angola has the, the conditions to cope 
with uh, their level and our expectations. Uh, so um, I would say that uh, the biggest challenge uh, it will be after COVID to grant that uh, with uh, the end of the lockdown globally, we all have some expectation that the consumption could ramp up a bit. And of course, that this could push a bit the, the oil price uh, in the international markets and in the end, uh, try to, to do some positive signs to the global e industry uh, itself. Uh, and of course, uh, Angola, e, as a top 20 producer worldwide, will be uh, engaged and will have some gain from that uh, ramp up. Uh, thank, thank you for that input. Uh, Adilson, uh, my question to you would be, I, I, we've seen a number of governments, you know, trying to halt layoffs due to COVID and the difficulties which we've seen. How do we keep more people on the payroll so that, you know, post COVID, uh, you know, service companies don't have to go and rehire? Have you had to let people go or how are you uh, uh, dealing with that at the moment? So um, thank you for the question. I think it's uh, a very important question in times like this. So what we're trying to do uh, with the clients is really try to come to an understanding of what costs are essential and what costs are not essential so we can continue the business moving. And of course, layoffs always come to the table when uh, challenges like this come, but it's not the first measure one can take. There are a lot of other measures you can take. Uh, the very first uh, measure you need to take is to, to, to be proactive in reaching out to the client and come up with solutions on cost, right? Renegotiate the deals before you end up in a situation where the, co the contract is actually canceled and therefore you need to lay off people. So you need to be very proactive in engaging the clients to find solutions on how to get the costs down. Number two is to perform. Okay, it's extremely important to make sure we, we perform seamlessly in, uh, when uh, we have situations like this because low performance actually have a huge impact in the cost of quality. Right, so you don't want to have additional costs when you are in situations like this. And then ultimately, after you've gone through all the exercise, looking at your supply chain, which is 70% of your cost, right, in industries like ours, after you've looked at 70% of your cost, which is supply chain, you then can look at the 30% of that, which is your manpower. And uh, it, it's a very, um, I don't really like to have this kind of discussions. It's one of those discussion, discussions a leader has, has a must, uh, but uh, you know it's always very painful to let people go. But we do that ultimately after we've gone through all the efforts to make sure we've gone to the minimum level of cost acceptable, and then uh, that's when you start to discuss layoffs. The go in terms of government, uh, I think Angolan government have been uh, very proactive in taking some measures to address COVID, both economically and health-wise. There is still a couple of things that can be done in terms of the economy. I think it is about time for the government to renegotiate its public debt uh, by uh, uh, negotiating a freeze on the service of the debt. That's extremely important. Uh, also to restructure the debt because they don't need more time actually to cope up with the pause they will be given in 2020 and review the budget, the annual budget. By reviewing the annual budget, I don't mean only to decrease the cost basis or the price basis of the oil in the budget, but I mean to reprioritize the project. Uh, lately, when you look at the news, you see those uh, programs of the municipes, and I ask myself whether they would be critical in times like this. It's a time where the government needs to create all the bases to survive. So I think there are a couple of projects that can be postponed for a later stage and focus on addressing the health issues, uh, helping companies, keeping people in the payroll with uh, a tax break. Uh, also, uh, 
re re redirect the, the money being spent in some of those projects to social assistance because there are families that have lost job in the lockdown that are families that cannot sell in the lockdown so it's important for money in the budget that was directed to projects that are non-essential be redirected to the survival of these people and then with the renegotiation of the budget uh, of the of the debt, Angola will have a lot of room for uh, addressing COVID because 60% of the budget uh, of the Angolan budget is uh, is uh, allocated to the public debt. So you see only 60% of that. So only 40% was allocated for new spend or other spends. And this is where the government needs to be strategic in posing up this debt and make sure we, he can use the 60% that was initially allocated for that to uh, address COVID in a uh, uh, tax break, giving tax break for companies to keep people in the payroll, as I've said, and also with social assistance. I think that's critical. Well, thank, thank you on that. Uh, uh, Frederico Costa, I think uh, you have a unique uh, perspective being the CEO uh of of technip the cfo sorry of technip and what i what i what i wanted to know from you is you know how uh what measures you guys have been taking with respect to cost control which of course is popping up like uh adilson was saying is becoming uh extremely important but also uh looking at uh the fx situation in the country something which uh, a lot of investors from outside uh, are always looking at with respect to coming into Angola or playing in Angola. Uh, you know, uh, the currency uh, moving uh, against the dollar or against the Kwanzaa in that sense is always uh, a major cause for concern. Uh, I, I would agree with others in that the government has been in recent times quite proactive in trying to 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 address that what do you think is the current situation and how can companies try and mitigate uh those difficulties at the moment given the price of oil mm -hmm. and of course the reducing uh mm -hmm. the reducing reserves oh, so first of all not sure if you if you can hear me very well i uh, hope the internet is stable so regarding the the fx part uh, the fx part really we saw starting in 2018 a lot of fiscal reforms from the government and we have seen uh, at the beginning of this year a uh, very positive signs that situation would improve so mainly uh, the bna the central bank has uh, liberalized the FX currency. It allowed uh, the banks to freely uh, trade with the ICOs, so the international oil operators. And for the first quarter, things were moving in a very positive uh, position. So we were having levels that were not seen uh, since the, the big crisis of 2014, and things were improving. That it was really a very good, a very good uh, answer to the market and to foreign investments. Uh, unfortunately, uh, end of the Q1 and beginning of Q2, uh, we had the COVID. So basically the COVID, the main issue that it has is the uncertainty. So right now, every forecast or every provision is, uh, it's worth what it's worth. So we can't really attach to it. And we have seen um, the FX law really taking a tumble. So uh, in terms of this liberalization also, uh, there was this opportunity and the government took very good steps in trying to put the FX, uh, the FX sales or the FX derivatives on the international markets, mainly through Bloomberg, through the FX Go platform. Uh, however, there were some constraints also because of the ICOs not being enrolled. So we saw in April and we are seeing in May really a big shortage of currency, of FX currency. And also uh, what we are going to see that we didn't see on Q1 and will have a good impact is uh, the market being flooded by Kwanzaa because a lot of uh, services company, international companies, they were able to edge their products mainly through treasure bonds and most of these treasure bonds close to 60 to 70 percent of the treasure bonds that are currently within uh, the market are due for this year so we will see a very big 
influx of Kwanzaa that will not be offset by uh, effects available on the market due to this constraint. So we will see inflation, unfortunately. Uh, we will have to see, uh, the government has to come up with solutions to bring back investment or at least to assure that uh, the foreign investors are able to to capitalize on their investments or to be uh, an attractive country to invest. Uh, we are currently now, and the COVID has also put the companies, as Frederico said very well, the companies are reviewing their capex costs. They are choosing very, very diligence where they are going to invest their money, where is less risk associated, and where is more uh, more return on investment. And right now we are facing Angola is facing two major competitors, mainly the pre-salt in Brazil and the new exploration in Guiana, that if the government doesn't take a step forward, trying to get effects, trying to get good conditions, uh, even if necessary tax breaks, we could see some potential disinvestment in Angola to, to go to, to other countries. Uh, as for cost savings, really, um, so it is, it is uh, within the company. We have all the companies within the oil and gas uh, have been hit and we are looking uh, mainly here in Angola to, uh, to uh, go, uh, go along with the strategy of all the multinational corporates. So Angola, uh, as, uh, as it was stated by Federico in the beginning, really hasn't taken a very deep uh, turn within the, um, the production. So the costs associated or the cuts uh, from OPEC will be in the round of 20, 25%. So this equates to three to 400 barrels per day. So it's less revenue that will come. Uh, however, given other, uh, other uh, locations, uh, it is not a very, very uh, high uh, uh, cut. So the cost savings, we have to do it. So it is mandatory, of course, for all the, we have to adapt to this organization. However, being in a multinational company, I have seen, uh, been more concerned with some other colleagues from other countries or from other locations that are very much uh, within the cuts and, uh, and layoffs and all the respective uh, downturn in that. So Angola, fortunately, is being a little bit spared on this. Uh, even in terms of production, in terms of investment. So most of the projects ongoing are still ongoing, uh, even though they are delayed. So the two or three big projects worth more than $2 billion are being delayed for one to two years. So that is a major constraint. However, they have not been canceled. And this is very positive. And the government has to capitalize on that and has to bring investment and bring attractive conditions to the market so that we can, we can move on to it. Okay, uh, thank, thank you on that. Uh, moving on from, from that, uh, Sergio, uh, what, are you, what are you getting, getting in the market? You know, Federico uh, Costa was just uh, talking about some of the projects uh, actually just being delayed but not being canceled in that sense. And that in as much as it's difficult, uh, it seems to him from his comparison, of other countries that Angola is probably in a better situation than in some other countries. Uh, despite COVID and you know, the price drop, where are you seeing opportunities uh, in the market for Angola? So where are you seeing opportunities, for example, for local companies uh, who can be able to take advantage of that? Well, uh, Verna, thank you for that. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I always like to, to talk about the positive outlook and uh, I think it's important in the way that uh, in, the, in the, the world that we're living today that we tackle the negative uh, sentiment for investment and you know I, we hear all around what's going on and, and, and we all know what the situation is but I think it would be very important uh, now just to do a quick uh, recap of where we were, let's say, two years, two and a half years ago, and where we are today, and what, uh, what uh, basis we have to be able to mitigate and find these opportunities. So as everybody knows, at the end of 2017, Angola went through a dramatic 
uh, change. You know, we changed presidents, uh, we changed the, the, the way things were done, uh, a lot of positive changes. One of the main ones in the oil and gas, at least, was uh, removing of the concessionaire um, responsibility from Sonangol and, and creating a, um, uh, uh, an oil and gas agency, okay? Uh, that was done uh, primarily um, from, uh, uh, it was after a, 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 a meeting, let's say, between the, the operators and, and, and the new administration. And they sat together and thought about what ways uh, they can uh, come together and create um, a, a good environment to, to, to make the industry uh, start to grow or, or, or revive it. So that happened, you know, under the president and the, and the new minister Diamantino. Um, the, the, the industry was uh, um, re reshaped and we had the agency and Sonangol entered into what they've been already trying to do prior to 2017, but they became more aggressive in it, which is their regeneration or re, uh, re, um, restructuring, restructuring uh, um, thing. So what the chamber did uh, at that moment was interact with the government and be able to create a platform in, in the shape of a conference that we organized which was to attract investors from outside, quality investment, but also get a, a platform for the local uh, players to be able to look at things in a different way and take advantage of what was being presented to the market by the new agency. Uh, that specifically was uh, a bid round that was done. Uh, it was also the presentation of a program for bid rounds, successive bid rounds for the next five years, where they uh, aligned investment opportunities for companies that created, uh, that created uh, let's say, predictability. So companies could look at the next five to seven years and look at what are the opportunities that are coming and align their strategies towards that. So um, all of that was done all of that was done when the market conditions were kind of bearish. We can admit that, you know, it wasn't a bullish situation, bullish perhaps for the United States where production was ramping up. Uh, you know, the, the U S became a net exporter. Uh, you know, they were, their economy, their oil and gas industry was expanding. Uh, while the rest of the world was trying to create and, and, and OPEC and its members, create a narrative and put up conditions to be able to attract investment. The chamber latched onto that, and we have been working with African governments, trying to attract investment from uh, Asia, from Europe, from the United States, to be able to look at this uh, change of narrative and be able to attract quality investment. So, Having had already a bearish, uh, say, a, a, a bearish uh, a sentiment into the market, you add the accelerant of COVID, let's call it an accelerant. You know, it, it just puts everything to, to create a tumble. So this is the situation that we live in today. But as Werner uh, said in the beginning uh, of, of this, of this uh, webinar, uh, these kind of situations bring opportunities. Uh, opportunities for uh, the local players, opportunities for the local service companies, opportunities for service companies that can latch on to the opportunities created by the IOCs. And the IOCs themselves are looking for opportunities. Uh, let's talk about, for example, Uganda. Look at what Total did. Uh, let's talk about what the, some of the IOCs in Angola are doing towards trying to accelerate the, the, the gas drive because there, re, there are opportunities in relation to other industries that can come out of the gas. Um, so so th those are the things. We had a, a bid round uh, that was planned for this year. It was actually announced um, in the newspaper for companies to come up with, with you know, like a pre-consultation process for that. And 
Uh, I think the agency was always clear from the beginning uh, and, and they presented it at the oil conference that happened last year that uh, non, uh, uh, there, there, there are, regardless of, regardless of the normal bid processes, they're always open for direct negotiations. So there are opportunities such as onshore. I'm sure that now with the lower costs in, in services, uh, a lot of countries are taking opportunities for lower risk plays, such as onshore. Um, marginal fields is something that has been uh, looked at for a while. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, gas production and uh, gas monetization and integration of Angola with other African markets. So there are a lot of opportunities. I know that Angola was at some stage uh, and it was uh, publicly announced at some stage negotiating uh, to do uh, some kind of uh, joint cooperation with Namibia, with Zambia, with Congo on uh, uh, gas uh, and, and, and fuel. So there are a lot of opportunities, uh, uh, Verna. And, um, and actually I cannot, uh, go on without mentioning, you know, Sonangol published, I think it was two weeks ago, a, an open, uh, open process to sell off some of its subsidiaries. Uh, I think there was like nine or 10 uh, or 15 subsidiaries, which opens up for opportunity. There is a, there is a, a good deal to be done. There are opportunities there. And, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, at the chamber, we say we like to make money. And uh, we're very bullish about this. So I hope it, it answers your question, uh, yeah. Verna. Yeah. I just want to touch on a last point. We can't forget that once, uh, once the, the, the president, once the president um, came to power and the MPLA came to power, uh, they issued the PND. So it's a national plan of development. The national plan of development highlighted very clearly what are the priorities for the government. And the priorities are primarily uh, initiatives to mitigate the decrease in production, okay? So what happens now um, is that we are having companies reorganize themselves, manage costs better. So there's opportunity to reorganize, uh, streamline operations, manage costs, in Angola, which is what's, what is happening. Adilson, I think, touched on it. You know, there's a lot of those things. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that allows for us to look at what we can do coming on to 2021. Uh, so I think this is, this is uh, kind of a, a, a highlight, Verna. We can go in deeply into more of the, of the specifics, I, but uh, that's my view. Open. I want to build up a little bit on what Sergio has said. Yes, I, I, I always call people into cautious, which is, you know, COVID will go away. It's, it will hit and have hit the world very hard, but it will go away. And we need to remain calm in times like this so we don't uh, lose sight of what is really critical and what is strategic. Because in times like this, companies offer governments a lot of good deals, so to say. They look good because they, the, the forecast is that the economy is looking bad and therefore people take opportunity and advantage of moment like this to negotiate best deals possible, right? Because you don't know what is coming in ahead. And as Frederico said, the main issue here is uncertainty. So let remain calm and look at what can we control as uh, companies, as governments. We can control how we perform. We can control what costs we can and we cannot incur. And as governments, we can control our budget. We can review our budget to the minimum possible. We can address social, uh, uh, social uh, assistance. But you cannot control what the oil price will be tomorrow. Even though today I've looked at the oil price and it was looking good because with the cuts in supply and the, the rise in demand, uh, that's what we'll, we will be seeing for the next times coming because the more and more demand is is ramping up with the economies open themselves up. So instead of rushing into a deal now, in a, because of the uncertainty that is coming tomorrow, and you have opportunities of deals on on, on top of your table, you know, take a deep breath and you know 
uh, do what you can control for now and you can you know let some of these decisions for two months from now and three months from now i think the main objective for 2020 is survive okay that's the main objectives companies will, will need to deal with and governments will need to deal with how can we survive that's that, that's what the main objective but COVID yeah. will go away and there will be a post-COVID and we need to be ready for that, but we need to be calm in times like this. Yeah. I, I deal, so I just want to say something. Rather than how to survive, I think the most important is not how the industry will rebound or what can be done because there are things that can be done and we can go into those specifically, but is how to remove the unpredictability because the unpredictability is what is scaring everybody. And that is the one that we have to challenge. And the chamber advocates for things that we can propose to be able to, to do that. And we've been doing it across Africa, across the different uh, geographies that we work with. And removing the unpredictability will be uh, giving us an opportunity to manage and plan and, and look at the positive outlook. Frederico, I, I go back to you there. I think uh, uh, Frederico Martins, of course, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have two Federicos here, so I always have to make sure that I call the second name. Uh, I think what is coming out here is, of course, the unpredictable nature of the business environment. Of course, th that is something that hits uh, everybody in the industry. So from your perspective, you know, uh, sitting where you're sitting, and looking at the number of different companies in terms of best practice, you know, what should local companies, and it's important to also always make the differentiation between local companies and uh, international companies, because I think international companies have a bigger breadth, you know, particularly the majors who are in petrochemicals, who have a downstream, huge across the world. It's different, it's diversified in that sense. So it's a little bit easier for them to be able to deal with that. But if at all you're looking at, you know, a mid-sized uh, Angolan company in that sense, how do they deal with this unpredictability? How do they keep people on the payroll? Because at the end of the day, you know, uh, this, the, the industry prices might go up and come down. What is important is that people need to be able to stay in jobs and economy needs to be able to continue going. So how, how, what is your advice in that sense to a mid-sized company uh, basically looking out or seeing contracts being cancelled in that sense and which doesn't quite understand the price dynamics and can't do anything about the price of oil as uh, has just been said. Okay, just be, before progress with your uh, discussion, uh, just to, to, to complement what uh, Adilson and Sergio has said, I would say that if we if, if I was asked to, 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 to do a matrix uh, around the opportunities in, in, in Angola, I would say that the local companies have a lot of opportunities around the onshore production to take over some uh, brownfields that uh, in the past were operated by uh, IOCs. Uh, the IOCs probably could ramp up a bit and uh, get a more interest, interest in, sorry, get a more interesting uh, uh, project finance uh, uh, playing some role in the uh, margin fields. Uh, and uh, there is uh, some expectation from the agency that the uh, international oil companies that are operating uh, huge blocks that could uh, uh, extend their production for some marginal fields and that it will bring some extra production. And uh, the, in um, one to two years, probably the IOCs will begin also to, to bid new, new fields. Uh, once the COVID has gone, like Adelson said. Uh, so the, the outlook itself, and um, I would like to remember that the cut that has been applied by OPEC is not a flat one, okay? So the, for the next four months, uh, Angola ha and will, can produce and uh, launch in the OPEC group 1.1 uh, 1 .1, uh, million barrels per day. And the four months later on, 
1.2 and in the beginning of uh, 2021 could come again to 1.34. So uh, the, the level of production that we are authorized to do is the level of production that we are doing right now. So uh, the, the point now is to maximize the profit. And that brings us to your question now how to decrease the unpredictability. So, uh, of course, that for uh, IOC, it's a bit more easier because the, 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 the portfolio is so huge that you could leverage a bit uh, your resources uh, uh, among the, 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 the portfolio you have. And even more, if you are in the, in the full value chain, you could try to integrate a bit more your uh, supply chain routines to, 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 to get some uh, profit from that. Uh, for uh, companies, the more local companies that are playing the market and that could not, uh, in fact, they can, could not influence influence this topic. So the unique thing that they could do is to react on that, the, the, I would say that the, the, these companies, what should invest? First, first thing is to try to uh, maximize their local content. And that brings the companies to a second topic, that is once they have expert people on board, they should have in top, top of mind, a knowledge transfer program a solid knowledge transfer program that enables that the local people acquire the proper routines, the proper skills to deliver the job. And of course, when we are doing a job and you can avoid several expenses like trip, uh, tax equalization, hotels, extra accommodation, you will become more profitable. Another thing that I, I think we could apply is that among all the industry and among the country, at least among us that we are here in this webinar now, that we dress more a position of partner. We should partner with. So what I mean, mean with partner with is try to create contracts based we, we that have a baseline that could cope with the costs of the companies the, but on top we could have some success fee that is a compromise that shows our level of engagement we, between companies between the supplier and for example, uh, IOC that is hiring uh, Adilson a company, for example, so, or uh, even uh, for the equal So if we try to equalize among a group of suppliers, uh, this uh, partnership uh, relationship, we will avoid a lot of um, uncertainty because we could try to bring to the group the best each one can do and try to leverage several things like expenses, common costs, uh, apply for example for some uh, uh, back office, common back office work among uh, some companies in order to try to keep focus each company in the things that they do properly. So for me, the top of mind in each company at this moment is to have a proper knowledge transfer program between experts and local content, push national people to assume responsibilities and to assume new, new top roles to drive the business and to try to shake hands and try to get a more partnership uh, relationship between several suppliers and the uh, and the players. Uh, Federico Costa, before I go to you, Grace, and then allow some uh, questions to yes. come in from the public, 
I just want to pick up from what uh, Federico Martins was talking about and ask Federico because uh, uh, Federico Martins seems to be saying local content is good for cost control if you do it properly. You know, so what are your thoughts from some of the figures that I've seen uh, in Angola? Uh, and I'm a local content guy all, all the way, you know. Uh, I, I want to see the next, uh, you know, the next batch of young Angolian uh, millionaires and billionaires, you know, who are coming out of the oil industry. Uh, we need that, you know, we, we, we need that. Uh, and my, my question to you, of course, is uh, what are your thoughts? You are looking at it, you know, from a CFO perspective, uh, local content, you know, being good for business. From some of the figures I've seen, about 40%, 30 to 40% somewhat of, uh, you know, labor that is still being used. You can say specialized labor in that sense that is still being used in the oil and gas sector in Angola is uh, from expatriates. Uh, what are your thoughts on being able to reduce that, you know, to might be you know 10 percent in that sense and enable uh angolan companies to take yeah. advantage of that so when it is a very very good question uh, it was uh, not on purpose i believe it was last week that this was a very very interesting article on the local newspaper on the national newspaper about the angolanization Angolanization processes. So, according to the law that has a couple of years, um, that brings this transfer know how, as Federico Martins was saying, this transfer of know how uh, from expects that uh, was not moving uh, as swift as uh, maybe the government and all our uh, ourselves Angolans would have liked. Uh, but at this moment, most of the oil operators have very high uh, Angolanization rates. So we are saying for the major five, we are looking at close to 85 to 90 percent uh, of the positions are already uh, provided by Angolan, Angolan uh, nationals. Uh, the industry in itself in Angola, the not all, also counting with services, are close to 70%, like you said, there is this margin of 30% that honestly, I truly believe that uh, the COVID will push forward. So one of the major, or some of the major um, HC, AJC um, initiatives that uh, most of the oil operators and even the, the foreign services providers have done at the beginning of the COVID was really the reallocation of all the expects. Uh, for safety reasons, and as such, it brought some room to to a more angolanization processes. So things are going uh, honestly, honestly, and here uh, not going too much of publicity. Uh, but our group, our company, is uh, close to 100% even on the board of administration of Angola Nationals. So we are not, I would not say a case study, but uh, we have really uh, applied for the past 15 years for this Angolanization. Uh, I was not here at the time, fortunately, but the people that were really did a very, very good job. And uh, at this moment, not only was Angolanization, but uh, uh, something that I also like to reinforce, even the positions, the, administ the operations positions and the country management or something are being awarded to, to our colleagues, our female colleagues. So there are, there are a lot of initiatives going on. Uh, we've seen some support from the oil ministry. Um, and the COVID will speed up that process. I really believe that the, even though, even though, and if I might add, it might look counter sense because now with the COVID, we see a lot of uh, no commuting and uh, homework or working from home. So working from home can be beneficial for expats since they can work from anywhere uh, close, but we are seeing completely the opposite. So companies want to invest in the local talent. They want people that are over there and it is a cost saving measure. Uh, Angola, uh, there is a lot of reports. Angola is still one of the most expensive cities in the world for expats. Uh, that in itself allows and uh, some ICOs have, I don't have access because it's confidential information in itself, but most of the ICOs, their expects package is higher when coming to Angola than for all other countries. So they are investing in uh, local contents 
and they are trying to do the share knowledge. However, also I would like to, to say, and given the experience of a company that is almost 100% national, that this process is a process that takes a long time. So to have uh, in administrative positions like Adilson, uh, like Sergio, even at Deloitte, that uh, I work a lot with Deloitte and all the big fours, to have uh, very good know-how on the executive positions, it takes 10 to 15 years at least of training, uh, of uh, putting people with international experience, with international that we see a lot of Angolans coming with uh, from international very high uh, reputation uh, universities and with very good cost courses um, and this is an ongoing project so i see as i spoken 70 close to 70 percent of the oil and gas industry is already national and we are looking for the next two to three years of an added 10 to 15 percent so i don't think we'll go to 90 until 2025 maybe uh, but by 2022-23, we can, we can be at 80%, which is very, very good. And in line, at least I speak for, for my company, in line with what these international companies have in other countries. Okay, Grace, you want to go ahead with some questions uh, yes, from the public? Yes, yes. We've got a lot of really good questions coming in. Um, also, before before I ask, uh, I just want to remind members of the media, please do uh, press the button uh, to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question at the end of this session. Um, so we have quite a few questions here. Um, I think first we can ask, and perhaps this is a follow-up to, to Mr. Correa's um, comments, on different cost-saving strategies. Unfortunately, uh, layoffs have been a part of that. Um, are there any laws in Angola restricting companies from laying off employees due to COVID? Uh, and also, what are the legal implications on temporarily suspending employment contracts until things improve? Uh, to me? If, you, if you'd like to answer the question or I'll open it to the rest of the panel. Uh, no, Wait. Okay. Well, uh, Go ahead. No, go ahead. For, uh, I would mm -hmm. say the the emergency declaration, the decree itself prevents company from firing people because the decree is managed is actually the legal ground for the 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 state of emergency measures. What you can and what you can't do is actually uh, is actually in the decree, and there is I think prohibition. I haven't. Uh, Gone deep dive into that, but there is prohibition on firing people during the state of emergency because of COVID. There's no specific law other by other than the uh, the crease itself to to regulate what you can and what you can't do. Yeah, the, I see. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's like that. So the the that is the the. the, the the law is designed to protect the, 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 employment, the employment, at least during the state of emergency. Um, and, uh, all, and I have to say that the, the government was, uh, government in Angola was pretty fast to put some, uh, some uh, topics to help the companies on, on the table. Uh, it has already launched several several uh, lines to support and to help the companies. Um, of course, that not all the topics can be applied to every company, but uh, any company has capacity to, to to ask for some help in certain in certain topics. So um, I would say that to all the people that is attending the webinar. To, 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 to screen the, what is uh, uh, launched by the government because for sure they will find some, uh, some interesting support for uh, some, some topics uh, that of course that will, will not solve the, the, the impacts from COVID but uh, will uh, leverage at least uh, a recover, a recover uh, program for the next uh, coming months. Thank you. Um, and the next question is as well posed to, uh, to the panel. Um, when you talk about the wealth of opportunities that remain uh, in Angola, what is the time frame we're looking at in terms of how long it's going to take for the market to rebound um, and for oil prices to, to stabilize post-COVID-19? 
I, I would like to start by addressing this one by uh, saying the following. I think the main opportunity we have ahead of us in terms of Angolans and the government is to review its strategy because there is a lot done in terms of the ground and policies uh, uh, landscape to attract uh, foreign investments. But Angola needs to look at three strategic objectives I think Angola have. Number one is its uh, sec national security. Number two is Angolans' uh, intent to attract private investments. And number three is Angola's uh, in uh, need to, diver to diversify its economy. And there are five key pillars linked to these three main objectives. It is the revenues, meaning source of return. Uh, Angola is ha heavily dependent on oil. And still in the oil sector, it can be diversified. So today, investing in downstream is no longer in uh, I would say a, a simple priority is the main priority Angola has, because as a matter of national security, you can't continue to rely on importation for you to have fueling your industries, your car. You know, you need to have it uh, localized. And that's one of the key, I think, areas where Angola needs still to, to do, a, uh, to, to heavily invest. So, uh, it's a matter of political, uh, it's a matter of uh, secure, national security risk, the downstream sector. It's a matter of diversifying the economy and it's a matter of attracting foreign investors. As an investor, you don't want to rely, you don't want to be staying three weeks uh, fighting for fuel when you have your industries to produce whatever you need to produce to put out at the market. So that's key for Angola. The second key pillar is agriculture. So we've heard uh, two weeks ago that uh, Angola has three months of food storage. I mean, I, I, as an investor, if I'm listening, listening to this, then I'm asking myself, so what will happen after three months? Okay, so you, you need to be able to stop depending 60% on the importation for you to feed yourself. And you need to be able to produce at, at the minimum 60 to 80% of what you consume needs to be produced internally. And that's actually a source of revenue because you can always sell the excedent of what you produce in terms of agriculture. Okay, and as an investor, it, has, it, it works perfectly for national security. It works perfectly for diversifying the economy because it becomes a source of revenue, but it also works perfectly with attracting foreign investment because investors look at how can I survive? How can I send people over? How can I feed uh, employees if they're out there? They don't wanna be looking at that just for the next three months. They want it to be strategic. The third one, uh, I would say, will be infrastructure with power and water. You don't want to be building uh, cars somewhere in Angola while relying on tanks of water. You want the water supply to be steady and, and you want it to be stable. So those are some of the key areas where Angola really need to take the opportunity of COVID to rethink on how to address them because it really plays along with the national security interests of Angola. They need to diversify its economy, but also with the uh, uh, attraction of foreign investments. Yeah. If I may, Grace, also? To, to, yes, pick up from, uh, to pick it up from Adilson. Uh, and what I see a lot of here on the chat, a lot of questions uh, or the million dollar question as they tell, as they, they speak about the oil prices. Uh, so to give here uh, an overview to, to all the attendees, uh, when I talked in the beginning of uncertainty is because um, to, to put it in perspective, close to 70% of all the oil production in the world goes to transportation. So this means that when uh, right now the ICOs and I saw the results from Equinor and from Shell cutting dividends for the first time almost ever uh, and also from our side as a services provider is that what the COVID really is putting the, the challenge on the industry and the uncertainty is how transportation will come and transportation not only on the commute because uh, working from home is starting and I think this is one of the positive uh, sides of the COVID is really as advanced uh, society or at least work a couple of years if not decades of putting uh, infrastructure to for people to be able to work from home with all the benefits in terms of commuting in terms of even of, uh, of uh, 
uh, a sense of life of being able to 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 do the own schedule but also on the transportation in terms of flights so the big issue of the covid and in terms of the oil price is how the uh, the the flights and the aviation will uh, will really uh, proceed after the covid so will it rebound back or not because over there is really really where the oil demand is going and what we are seeing is that we are seeing a very very low demand as of now close to 25 percent less than what we had pre-covid and this takes a lot of impact on the on the market however however to counterbalance that or to offset that we have the shale production in the states so the shale production in the states i believe is really what will define at least in the short to medium term how the oil price will bounce back because the shale industry is not profitable at these rates that we have between the 20 25 even going to 30 or 35 dollars per barrel so the shale if if it doesn't recover as it did in 2014 that was able for a short period of time to get between the 20s and the 30s and bounce back and really took off from there so we saw that the shale survived this big test uh, because there was demand also so it was able to 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 use the supply that it had to the demand however given the covid if we don't see the same demand then the shale industry is going maybe for very very difficult times and maybe shutting down almost completely especially in the united states and this in itself will really raise the prices i've seen this week some reports from uh, very reputable firms and uh, um, agencies that is still very much possible that oil price could reach 100 by the end of the year given that the demand uh, will even though it will cut to 20 25 percent but the supply especially the shale will erase uh, almost all the balance of the market so it is very very uncertain and we have the shale and especially the aviation industry as the main catalyzers for how the price will go so uh if i can just give a stab to this point uh, seeing that everybody has said something something quick just a quick one uh, I'm not for uh, I'm not for for trying to guess or how things are are going to be. I'm more for uh, looking at the facts. And the fact is that it seems to me there is no global coordinated effort uh, to you know to really tackle this as as a whole world together. It seems everybody's in the corner doing their thing. And to me that tells me that each government should look in-house and look at what are the specific opportunities that they have and find the best way to address those and present those to the market, to the investors, local, uh, international. There are people still looking internationally. I, I mentioned the, the Uganda deal for, 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 for Total. You know, what caused Total to pull the trigger was obviously the timing, you know, and the timing brought the opportunity. So what I'm saying is that Angola needs to look inwards and look at legislation, what legislation it can, can do, change, improve, uh, promote, to, to get people to continue to take a punt, continue to be there, new guys, new people, people perhaps listening to this, come into Angola, have a look at Angola. Um, like I said, the, the agency under the, the leadership of uh, Ingeniero Paulino Geronimo has taken the, taken the, um, the, the action of uh, uh, putting itself open to the world via their website and via their email and people can still interact uh, uh, through the internet with the, with the, with the agency. Uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, Angola looking at presenting its low-hanging fruit. Uh, Angola and as many African countries, they're very bountiful with opportunities and resources. Um, you know, when, you, when you're walking in the field and you see a tree full of mangoes, you know, which mango are you going to go for first? You're going to go for the lowest hanging mango. 
the one that looks ripe. So presenting those, presenting the low hanging fruit and the best opportunity for people to come and invest. Um, there's been a lot of talk prior to COVID about regional integration and regional investment, promotion of regional uh, cooperation. So there's opportunity there. We have the IOCs in Angola who are also present, present in other regional geographies. There is opportunity for that. To touch to Adilson, you know, agriculture, yes. Fertilization plants, very, uh, very good opportunity to, to put together. You know, I think that companies such as uh, ENI and, and other companies present in the gas consortium, they are looking at these, these opportunities. So, uh, you know, things like making uh, visas easier, making uh, travel easier, making procedures for the oil uh, workers easier. You know, these are the things that African countries are looking at to, to make it more attractive. So I think in summary, uh, just to, to summarize, yes, we don't know, it's unpredictable, but what can we do uh, in Angola to be able to dress up these opportunities and people continue to spend? The world hasn't stopped, money is flowing, but how can you get the money to come there, to come to us? You know, as I said, and I continue to say, you know, and NJ Ayuk says it's, we like money. We, we like to promote money. Let's create opportunities and dress them for the money to come. And, 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 and I think, I think that, and that, and that will just create opportunities for local content. And by the way, touching on local content, uh, I'd like to make a very clear distinction because this has touched me for the last 12 years in Angola. There is local content and there's local participation because what Werner talks about is millionaires owning their oil fields and millionaires owning their local companies versus Angolans having high quality, good paid, uh, technical or non-technical uh, jobs in the oil industry, you know, from, uh, from the service companies to, uh, you know, uh, reservoir engineers and, 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 and geologists. So those two are two separate things. They're intertwined, but separate. And there are opportunities for all of those. And I think all we have to do is design and dress and, and make it look good so that the opportunists or the investment, the quality investment can continue to come. I'm, I'm glad you, you, you touched this point just a few minutes there, uh, Werner, because uh, one, the one key issue we, we will find across all the industries and sectors of the economy in Angola is supply chain. If you look at the oil and gas production, right, where does the services and goods that support the oil and gas, oil and gas production in Angola comes from? It's 80% from either uh, foreign companies or uh, of goods that were manufactured or produced outside of the country, right? So if you go to downstream, it's also the same. You don't even have a downstream industry. You, you have distribution, but what, what are you really distributing? It is things you are importing, right? Once again, the supply chain is outside. You do the same in agriculture. So what you're selling at the stores is again, the supply chain is outside. So I think as we speak about local content, and the local participation in the next uh, group of millionaires out of Angola, we need to start to look at where the opportunity is now. I want oil and gas producers to be Angolans. I want companies that really are owned by Angolans to produce oil, but I want these companies to tackle where the opportunities are first, which is, which is in the supply chain. And that will come with the local content policies by enforcing local content policies, but not only enforcing, but make capital available for companies to you know, start new businesses, to fulfill the gap in the supply chain, where is the problem is. Okay, I don't, I, if I want to compete with an IOC today, I, I will probably not be able to do it as a local oil producer. So will I start there? No, I will start to provide service to this, local, to this IOC. And that means supply chain. So 80% of the supply chain of this industry still come from outside. Let's make sure that 
we can shift the balance towards locally. And then we can start to talk about oil and gas producers being nationals, right? I think that's the right step forward. And we do the same uh, within the other industries, whether in agriculture, whether in, uh, in, in the downstream industry, we need to be able to depend on the Angolan market to produce the level of services and goods that are needed for those industries to, to move forward. That's the very first step when it comes to local content and billionaires coming from Angola. Thank, thank you very much on that one. I, I just go now a quick closing round. Uh, I'm conscious of time and the fact that people have to move on to other things. Uh, Federico Costa, uh, going forward, taking advantage of opportunities uh, going forward in that sense, uh, what, what would be, I would say, if at all you were talking to a potential investor looking at getting into Angola, you know, what should they be looking at in terms of what makes it easy to be able to make money in Angola from your perspective? So first of all, and uh, uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to be a little biased on this, but on the financial, I think the most important and really uh, what we have to look forward in terms of the government is to understand, uh, and I think this is also comes from a clash of mentality, you have to understand that a foreign investor, he comes here to Angola to invest, but his main goal is the profit. So no one comes here for charity, they come here for profit. And to be able to, to have profit, he is also able to export this profit. So the, the main issue, the main issue, there are two main issues. So I'll go first on the financial part. So on the financial part, the government has to be very clear and has to really uh, step up the uh, FX situation. So we can't have the devaluation that we have now. It's not attractive when uh, someone comes to this country or is looking forward to this country and then he sees the struggle that they have exporting the capital. So this is really one of the major focus. The other one that Adilson touched two or three times and I very much appreciate that and going forward is the infrastructure. So for the, the international investor to come here to Angola, he has to be able to have a supply chain, uh, a supply chain that uh, really uh, he can afford and it can use here in Angola. And the big issue that I see here in Angola from my perspective and other, other services provider is that the lack of infrastructures really constrains the pricing. So what we see is that, uh, and uh, from, uh, from experience not only in my company that has industry, that has a, a factory here that is the only one in Africa, of umbilicals, but also from the other other um, supply chain that we buy locally, is that the pricing sometimes is not competitive because when you have to take in accounting the oil that you have to do to the generator to produce electricity that in other countries is almost free. When you take in consideration the water that you have to produce that you have to buy outside. So it doesn't make competitiveness. So to, to really push for, for an investor right now, we have to take infrastructures to allow uh, prices to go down, especially the local content be able to produce at prices that are competitive. And also, and once again, I think, uh, I think the government has, to, has this knowledge and know-how. However, it's not always bad to reinforce. We have to understand that foreign investors, they come here to do profit. They don't come for charity, so they must be able to uh, to return back the profit that they will come because when you have profit when you export profit you bring other companies you bring other investors you bring other foreign investors and the the profit in itself it doesn't mean that all the money or all the the revenue goes outside it means only part of the profit because the other part will come will stay here to expand the economy to be able to to use on infrastructures to be able to develop local content and to be able even to pay taxes so uh, the government has to work for it. Uh, the privatization we are not able to discuss here, but the privatization uh, of most of the Sonangol participations is going underway. We are seeing some positives. We are seeing some foreign investors really interested in and buying a, a couple of, uh, of uh, companies. So this privatization is working, but once again, 
as long as the investors know that this is a safe country, that there's no risk associated with infrastructures and with exporting capital. Final word, uh, Federico Martins. Sorry, uh, Federico Costa, I just want to say something there. I think what you set up there is, is an opportunity for us to challenge the local banks to be able to play a greater role in the oil industry. And, uh, and maybe you can make a comment on that as well. Mm -hmm. No, uh, uh, I, I agree with you, Sergio. And as I, I said in the beginning, really the new FX law and the liberalization, it came with very positive results. We saw a Q1 that was very, very positive, gave great indications to the market. And the government now must capitalize on that. So we have seen, as I told you, the FX Go, that is the Bloomberg, uh, the Bloomberg platform. We saw also uh, in the beginning, it didn't work because sometimes you try. In the, uh, it didn't work. We have seen uh, in the last month uh, uh, low appreciation of the currency because it was the uh, foreign panel of Bloomberg and international uh, sponsors that were uh, guiding the Kwanzaa. However, now that we came back to supply demand, there was uh, a big devaluation. So uh, the market is starting to work. So we have seen liberalization. The, I, I see, uh, the, the IOCs are really uh, being able to sell it. But once again, they can only sell what they are going to need. So once uh, supply chain management national. So the, the international oil companies, they have to have uh, goods and services to buy locally otherwise they will not bring their own currency to here they will not sell to the market so this is the steps on financial i think the government is really taking good steps the covid really took a downturn because things were improving and now the government has to look into what can or cannot do about it so uh, if necessary going to the reserves uh, I speak once again, bias on the oil and gas. I know that we have medication, we have uh, uh, basic needs, we have basic goods that also have to be prioritized because the country is really struggling on those matters. Uh, however, it's very hard to bring foreign investors right now to those markets. So the oil and gas is still the, the industry that moves the country in terms of exportation. And it has to take it has to take a, a really a big approach from the government on that stance. Okay. Um, just, um, just, um, the, well, just uh, picking up what Frederick was saying and the, the point that Sergio brought to the discussion. Uh, um, I'd like to share. I don't know if all the people are aware, and probably the, our attendees in the webinar know that the local banks commercial local commercial banks are now working with the ERDP ERDP is the is the the institute for uh, derivatives so look looking to the downstream part or uh, downstream part of the value chain and they are working together to have more uh, lines of um, investment loans to local players to develop business around storage and distribution of course that uh, uh, considering the the level of investment the capex in upstream is huge of course so it will be a bit tough to to to, 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 to the local commercial banks to climb uh, in the in the in the value chain to support the major upstream uh, capex projects, but to support uh, the downstream projects is already being done some work. Is being done some work, and that is the, is critical because uh, one thing that could um, push to a level to a better standards uh, level in the industry in, in angola is to have a more integrated more integrated uh, value chain not only in, in 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 the oil and gas but also in other in other in other sectors because unfortunately um, Actually, in Angola, we don't have a lot of integrated value chains. But for example, if the oil and gas could uh, launch the trend, and uh, of course, that in uh, in Angola, the oil and gas 
industry is also obligated to launch good trends because is uh, is the biggest chunk in terms of contribution to the state budget and still be the state of the art in terms of uh, of um, uh, standardization uh, I would like to share with the people that is with us that the local commercial banks are doing this effort to support investments in companies, local companies that are working now to the industry. Of course, that is more focused in downstream, exactly because the level of capacity they have to um, enable loans are more linked to, to downstream but it is also uh, a sign that uh, all together we could do some uh, progress. Thank then you. My, oh. my final words will be, look, every time you speak about investors and foreign investments, there are two things that come to the table. Am I able to expand my, my revenues, right? That's what Federico Costa said. And the second thing is, uh, is Angola is too expensive. If you listen to, foreign investor when speaking about Angola is always, I can't ex expand my, my revenue and Angola is too expensive. So that will come down again to the investments that need to be down in downstream. Uh, does it, that investment will of course reduce the cost of the diesel and all the derivatives because it's product produced and bought locally, but also will enable the government to save money. They will stop buying oil to import oil Okay. That's extremely critical that the government does it. So it's critical. The, the, the downstream, the investments on the refineries, is no longer a matter of if, of if, it's a matter of when. It needs to happen. Okay. So And also the agriculture part of that, as I was speaking about, it is, is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It needs to happen. So those are the really two critical projects I think the government needs to launch in able to attract more involved investment. Because in terms of the legal background, everything was done, the agency and all those kind of things were done. But companies, even the ones here in Angola today, the IOCs and others, if they will continue to invest, they want, they want those questions to be answered. You know, they want what is the cost of living will be. And in the cost of living, you have the fuels of the cars, you have the meals of the kids, and you know, the, 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 infra the cost of the power, the infrastructure cost. So those costs needs to come down and they will require special attention of the government to, to be invested in so that they can come down and they can be an attraction to the investors. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your for your final con comments and for participating in this panel. Uh, Mr. Costa, Mr. Correa, uh, Mr. Paolo and Mr. Pugliesi. Uh, we have reached the end of this webinar. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and for being uh, such an active audience and submitting your questions. Um, thank you very much to Werner for, for moderating. Um, before we sign off, I have a few quick announcements. Uh, first of all, the second annual Angola Oil and Gas Conference and Exhibition is going to be held in Luanda later this year, so October 14th to 15th. Uh, please visit AfricaOilandPower.com uh, for more information and to register. We'd love to see you there. Um, again, you'll be able to find a video of today's session on our YouTube channel, AOP's YouTube channel. And finally, uh, please visit AOPWebinars.com to register for future uh, upcoming webinars. We have a South Sudan webinar on May 25th, as well as a renewals, renewables webinar on the 28th of May. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you there as well. So yeah, in the meantime, have a, a wonderful rest of your day or evening, wherever you are, are located and um, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. Obrigado. Obrigada. <laughs> Bye -bye. Bye. Stay positive. Bye. Stay, stay <laughs> not home. COVID, not COVID positive. Stay positive. <laughs> stay home. Bye. Take care.